Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good? Welcome to all of you that are joining us online, all of you that are live here at NRH, those of you at our West Fort Worth campus, our Keller campus, and our launch crew for our upcoming Dallas campus. Yes, 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 yes. We are celebrating what God is doing here, and he is doing amazing things. My name's David. I'm one of the ministers here. And y'all, it is Baptism Sunday. It might as well be Christmas morning for me, all right? This is incredible, and I know you are excited as well, because here's the deal. Lives are going to be changed today. There are some of you sitting here right now, at least I have prayed this, that you don't even know that you're going to get baptized in the next 30 minutes, and yet the Holy Spirit is going to do something in your heart and move you in a way that you haven't been moved before. I want you to know we've got towels, we've got all the supplies in the back, we've got everything ready for you in the physical realm for you to be able to take that step to be able to come home. Because see, if you've been around here for a minute, you know that we have a mission here, and that is to make and grow followers of Jesus. And this morning, we are laser focused on the make aspect of that mission, in that your life can be completely different. You can be made new. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, and that he rose again on that third day, and you want him to be your Lord and Savior, you know what it is that you need to know for your life to be completely different. But you heard a mission that wasn't just about make, but it was also make and grow. And that grow component is is that we would become more and more like Jesus. That he would become greater and greater and we would become less and less. And that's an invitation to a better way to live. And so we've started this series. Rick Ashley, our senior teaching minister, has started this series last week entitled, It's a Must. And in order to look like Jesus, Jesus said his words, not ours, that this is, or these are some things that you must do. And last week we started the series with a sermon that was titled, Death is a Must. All right, let's be honest. That sounds like a buzzkill, doesn't it? (laughs) Death is a must? Like, that's how we're going to start this thing out? We're going to put out a welcome mat and it says, all you come in who are ready to die? I'm just like, what? And and it wasn't that I was doubting Rick. Don't, Don't misunderstand. But if I'm being honest and maybe more concerning, I'm kind of like, Jesus, is this really the way that we need to do this? Is this how this should start? Like people that are coming to church that hadn't been to church in a long time, and, and we're talking about you got to die, and, and just, it just seems like maybe there's a better way. And, and then as I was sitting there kind of wrestling, I was reminded of this story where this guy named Peter was standing in front of Jesus kind of saying, hey... The way that you want to do it's wrong, and let me tell you the better way to do it. And Jesus said, hey, Peter, it's obvious right now you're being more influenced by Satan than you are by me. And so I need you to step out of the way, and I need you to get behind me. And I knew that that is not what I wanted to hear from Jesus. And so I started to say, okay, Lord, instead of looking at what it is that you might be doing wrong, what is it that I'm getting wrong? And he began to show me. We have abundant life to offer. We have a better way to live. And the ways of the past need to be put to death. And sometimes when we just think about how life has always been and how life currently is and where it feels like it's going, it's always been broken. It's always been a mess. And so why would it ever be any different? But that's not our story. That's not the story that you have been written into. Our story is bigger than that and better than that. And so we've got to go back to our origin story, especially in light of creation, and see and be reminded, how did it start? Genesis 1.31 says this, Then God looked over all he had made. And when he looked over all he had made, it included you because he is not bound by time and he could see you when it was that he was looking over all that he had made. And he saw that it was very good, exclamation point. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. Our story, the beginning of our story is in paradise, in glory. 
And we have the prophetic word of John. We started in Genesis, but we go all the way to Revelation at the end of his, his word. And John has this vision, and he sees that God's with his people. He's walking around with them. There's no more tear. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more death. You see, our story, our story starts in beauty, and it ends in beauty. Even though we are currently in the midst of a lot of brokenness. And so now the idea of death is a must. Oh, it's not a buzzkill. It's an invitation. It's an opportunity. It's marking the doorway of the journey that we can walk into, a life of liberation, a life of freedom, a life of abundance, a life that answers the questions, where did we come from? Why are we here? Where is it that we are going? And so... I can relate a little bit in that wanting to know when that's coming, when God's kingdom is coming with a guy that we're about to read about in scripture in John chapter three, his name is Nicodemus and he's got questions. He's confused. He wants to know what's going on. How is it that I can enter into this kingdom of heaven that I have read about all of my life? You see, he was a Pharisee. That means he was part of this uh, religious elite, if you will. He was also a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was kind of the Jewish Supreme Court of the day. He had influence. He had power. He had wealth. If he were in Texas, we would say, he's a big deal, okay? <laughs> this guy is a big deal. And so we pick up an encounter that he has with Jesus in John 3, verses 1 through 7. There was a man named Nicodemus a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. And after dark one evening, don't miss that, he's coming under the cloak of darkness. He is sneaking in to try to figure out what's going on. He doesn't want to, other people to know that he's coming. He came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Oh, no, 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 no. His miraculous signs are not that God is with him, but that he is, in fact, God. And Nicodemus is blind to this truth. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot see that I am the Messiah, that I am ushering in a new kingdom. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? In other words, he's saying something so preposterous because he feels like it's preposterous for Jesus to tell him that he is not good enough to be in the kingdom now, this religious man. Can you relate? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. You see, today's declarative statement that Jesus makes as you want to become more and more like him is you must be born again. Which is actually really good news because if we're talking about that death is a must, well, at least there's an opportunity for us to come back and we can be born again. But what, is that, what does that look like? How does, that, how does that happen? That word again jumps out at me, and yes, it means repetition. In other words, we've been born before, and we have to be born again. But in the original language, it also means from above. You must be born from above. And you're going to find that the repetition and the from above both apply as we continue to learn what it is that Jesus means. Again, let's go back to our origin story. Not the origin of creation, but the origin of us. Of, of, of humankind. What did that look like? Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life. The breath of life means spirit. He breathed spirit into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Not Holy Spirit, not capital S, but lowercase s. You see, when he made us, he didn't just make us as physical bodies, but he also made us to have a spirit. We are spiritual beings as well. And so if we kind of keep going forward in that story, we know that the, the wheels kind of come off soon thereafter. Because God said, hey, you can have full reign to Adam and Eve. Eat anything you want, except for this one tree in the center. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat the tree of life. You can eat anything you want, but you can't eat that. 
And one day they succumb to their curiosity and they, they succumb to, to wanting to be in control. And they sinned and they ate something that they weren't supposed to eat. And in that moment, history and future forever changed. Because when sin entered in, into the world, so did death. Romans 6.23 says it this way, for the wages of sin is death. And yet here's the thing, as we read the story and we know that they've sinned and we know that they're separated from God, we know that they're hiding from him, he comes searching for him, he's pursuing them, even in their disobedience, they haven't died. I've sinned, you've sinned, and yet here we are. We're moving towards death, but we haven't died. What are we, what are we trying to learn? What is God trying to tell us here? And when he says the wages of sin are death, he's talking about a spiritual death that's happening and that our spirit has been cut off from God's spirit. And we have been separated from him. And if you think about it back in the garden, you know, we think, okay, they sinned, so they should get in trouble. And so God's just going to be mad and he's just going to be punitive. And so he just kicks him out of the garden and he de- never wants to see him again. That is not the reality of what happened. Yes, it is the result of what happened, but it is not the motivation of our loving father and why he did that. In fact, he was worried that out of now in this place where we are separated from him spiritually, that we still had access to the tree of life, and that if we had eaten from the tree of life at that point, we would have spent eternity separated from him spiritually. That is the definition of hell. And so when he was kicking them out, yes, there was some punitive to it, but there was more love and compassion and mercy and redemption Because he wanted to make a way so that we could ultimately come back to him, so that we could ultimately come back home. And that's what is before us today. So how do we come back home? Nicodemus asked the same question in verse 9. He says, how are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. He's asking Jesus. And Jesus kind of gets on to him a little bit, and he's like, look, you know the Old Testament. You know the stories You should know this, but he doesn't withhold it from him, even though he says he should know. He says this, he says, no one, Jesus is talking, no one has ever gone to heaven and returned. But the Son of Man has come down from heaven. He has come down from above. And as Moses lift up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. That is the answer to the question, how is this even possible? You see, as humans, we can reproduce humans. But because our spirit is dead, we can't. And so remember what Jesus said in verse 6. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit, capital S, gives birth to spiritual life. Death is a must so that we can be reborn, but in this rebirth, it's different than the one that we had before. It is coming from above. It is God's spirit that is coming and regenerating our spirit. He promises this in John 14, verses 16 through 17. Listen to this, church. And I will ask the Father, Jesus is talking, and he will give you another advocate. It might say counselor in your version, who will never leave you. Say that together. He will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. When the Holy Spirit comes, capital S, and regenerates our dead spirit because of sin, we never have to worry that we're ever going to be separated from him again because the Holy Spirit is never going to leave us. And that is incredible news that changes everything. And if you find yourself today going, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, and that he rose again on the third day, and you want him to be your Lord and Savior, then you are ready to take a step back home. And as we think about what this opportunity is before us, and we start getting excited about it, I want to make sure that there's three clarifying points that we don't get confused about what we're saying. The first is this. You must be born again, but you mustn't work for it. This is not something that you can earn. This is not something that you can pay for. This is not something that if you just do more good things than you've done bad things, then you are going to be okay and you are going to be 
in God's kingdom. No, friends. You are unable to pay the debt that your mistakes and that your sins have created. And yet some of us have been in church 70 years, 50 years, 30, you fill in the blank, doing the dance, hoping we get it right, serving when we should, being generous with our money, doing all these other things and just going, okay, Lord, I, I, just, I just need to make sure that I'm going to be okay. So it, so it all falls on me. And so I just want to make sure that I'm the one that can do it. And, and I, don't, I don't really need a Lord. And I can say this with great conviction because that's part of what my journey is like. I wanted to live life the way that I wanted to live, and as long as I was better than the people that were around me, then everything should be okay. And yet, Jesus isn't after better. He's after holiness. He's after perfection. He's offering you a better way to live. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says it this way. God saved you by his grace. Grace, unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. When you believed, and you can't take credit for this, it is a gift from God. Gifts from God are free. That doesn't mean they're cheap. It cost him his son. It's incredibly costly. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, because that's what we do. We start to play the comparison game and try to see who's better. Jesus is the model. Let's all try to live a life to become more like him. And maybe you're here today and you're like, look, that's not my problem. My problem is, is I know what my story is and I know that I've blown it long ago and there's no way that I'm ever being invited back home. And yet I keep hanging around and I keep looking, I keep checking in the windows. Maybe one day the door will get left open and I can kind of sneak in. Friends, I want you to know that while you must be born again, you mustn't worry if you're invited. Everybody is invited into Jesus' kingdom. And I don't know what it is that your life looks like. And I don't know what it is that you've done. I don't know how many times you've done it. I don't know how recently that you've done it. But what I know is that what Jesus has done at the cross is so much more powerful than any mistake or mistakes that you make. And you will never be beyond the far-reaching arms of grace. Paul. Paul says it this way to to Timothy. He's writing to a younger brother in the faith, and he says this. He says, this is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Everyone is invited to be able to come back home. And so when we begin to understand that we can't earn it, we can't pay for it, that we haven't been disqualified from it, that we can't just sin our way away from God, but there actually is an opportunity for us to come back home. What, is that, what does that look like? What, what, what impact should that have on me? Well, there's a story that many of you know that I love to read over and over again. It's called The Prodigal Son or The Lost Son. It's found in the 15th chapter of Luke. And there's this young man, just to give you a quick recap, he goes to his dad and he says, you know what, dad, it'd just be better if I had your money now and I could leave here and go live the way that I want to live. In other words, be better off if you were dead and I just got what it is that you worked for. My life would be better. I don't know that there's any more hurtful language that a parent could hear. And yet the dad says, okay. In other words, death is a must. And he allows the son to go off to a far land and he gets involved in all sorts of things that we're not allowed to talk about in church, right? Blows all the money, doesn't have anything left, not sure what he's going to do. He's, he can't even eat. He's working. He's eating the food of the animals that he's taking care of. And then one day, he has a moment of clarity. Luke 15, verses 17 and 18 says this. When he finally came to his senses, talking about the son, when he finally came to his senses, when he had a moment of clarity, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father. He knows that if he goes home, it'll be different. And here's the deal. While you must be born again, you mustn't wait for it. 
when you know, when you know that Jesus is the Son of God, when you know that he paid for all of your sins, when you know that he stepped out of that tomb proving who he said he was all along, and you want him to be your Lord and Savior, that is when you run home to your Father. You see, as we want to become like Jesus, we do what Jesus did, and we do what he said to do, And so from a very practical sense, when you believe those things, you now take this step called baptism. In part, because Jesus did. We hear about Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3, 13 through 15. It says, then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, talking about John the Baptist. But John tried to talk him out of it. Can you imagine Jesus coming to you to be baptized? He says, I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. He said, so why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. Did you catch it? We want to be like Jesus. He becomes greater and greater. We become lesser and lesser. We must carry out all that God requires. And he requires that we get baptized. And I love talking to people when they're exploring who Jesus is and and, and what it is that he's offering them. And and they get to this point with baptism and they're like, all right, so what's the deal with this? And why why is this so important? And I'm like, okay. I always want to drive them to Romans 6, 3, and 4. Because it just, it just, the language is so rich, especially in the midst of what we've been talking about in the first two weeks of this series. But here's what the verses say. It says, or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. In just a few moments, we extend an invitation to everybody in the room to be able to come forward and to be baptized. If you have not taken that step, they're going to find themselves in the water and they're going to be asked, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on the cross? Do you believe that he came back to life? Do you want him to be your Lord and Savior? And they're going to say yes, and then we're going to dunk them, right? What's the last thing they're going to do before we dunk them? (gasps) They're going to hold their breath. They're going to take their last breath. They are going to die. And then we are going to bury them. And they're going to come up out of that water, and that water is going to cascade off of them. That water represents the blood of Jesus. It's not that water that cleanses them, but it's their belief in Jesus. It is their belief that his blood was shed for them, that their sins are removed from them as far as the east is from the west. And they are going to breathe a new life. They are going to be born again. This is what we live out every time we see somebody say yes to Jesus and comes forward and gets baptized. But I don't want you to just be caught up in the logistics and the rules. We got to be careful because this is about a relationship. This is about you coming home to your dad and knowing that he longs for you to be there. Sin is not just the payment for just just the penalty for us that it is all dependent upon us and it's just bad for us. God knows it even more than we do, and He desperately wants to be with us. He's never stopped loving us. He wants to be in relationship with us. So let's go back to that son. He figures out, I'm gonna go home, right? And he says, And this is what my this is what my speech is, this is what my plan is. So I'm gonna go home and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Did you catch it? I'm no longer who you created me to be. But now I'm something less. I'm a hired servant. I'm a slave. He has accepted a lesser identity. He has accepted a false identity. Friends, what is your lesser identity that you've been living under far, far too long? Is it that you're a perfectionist and you got to get it all right and you got to keep working and you got to keep working and you got to keep working and hopefully someday you're going to nail it and everything's going to be okay? Is it that you struggle with some kind of addiction and that addiction is now what your identity is and all you are is a user of fill in the blank? 
Is your identity found in what it is that you own or what it is that you do or what it is that you've succeeded in? All of those are lesser identities and false identities. And when you bring that to the Father, when you bring that home to Him, this is what it looks like. The son goes home and he said to him, his son said to him, his son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy being called your son. We know what's coming next. We've already heard the speech. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine, not this hired servant, but this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to party. I'm ready to see people come home to Jesus, to come home to their father. You know that you can't work for it. You know that you're invited, and you know that you don't have to wait for it. And again, to drive it home, what it means relationally, and what it means for a father to welcome his son home, would you please direct your attention to the screen? Hello, please leave a message after the tone. Hey, Dad. It's me. I know it's been a long time since we talked. I was, I was hoping you'd answer, but uh, I understand you probably don't want to hear from me. But I know you've probably written me off, and I can't blame you for that, actually. Just, here's the thing. It's kind of a shot in the dark, but um, I'm coming through town soon, and I'd really just like to see you. If you want to see me, just hang a small sheet out on the porch. And if the sheet isn't there when I drive by, I'll just keep going. And I'll try not to bother you anymore. I know I can't just show up at the front door like I used to. I've just gone so far in the things I've done, and I just, I just regret it. You know, I know how bad I hurt you and let you down, but Dad, I miss you. I miss how we drive around and just talk about life. And I just, I just want to come home. I love you, Dad. If you're wondering if you can come home, you don't have to wonder anymore. Jesus has paid it all. He has invited you. And you don't have to wait any longer because you need to know that as you're driving by over and over again, that God, our Father, God, our Dad, Abba, Father, has put the sheet out. And he has said that you are welcome here and you always will be in just a moment we're going to stand and we're going to worship together but we're going to worship while we've invited you to come home and if you believe that Jesus is the son of God and he died on the cross and he rose again and you want him to be Lord and savior of your life come forward grab a towel we've got everything that you need in the back People ready to walk with you and help you through this journey. And today is just the beginning. But it's a beautiful beginning. So would you all please stand. And as we worship, would you please come home.